Welcome to Off The Record. I'm your host, Marika, and I'm a dietitian, nutritionist, and recovering perfectionist. Join me each week as I bring you raw and real conversations with inspiring men and women discussing matters in health and nutrition that are often swept under the rug. Sit back, relax, pour yourself a cup of coffee or a wine, and enjoy learning from conversations that help us to understand the messiness of what it means to be a healthy and balanced human. Hey everyone and welcome back to another episode of Off The Record. Today's episode is a bit of a taboo topic which I love um, and hopefully after today's episode it is not so much of a taboo topic at least to you and to your circles but what we are talking about today is sex and in particular painful sex and we are joined today by Ash Mason, who is a holistic physiotherapist and women's health educator who lives in Melbourne. And she has a special interest in trauma-informed women's health and chronic pain. Now, she has a really incredible story herself um, with her own experiences with chronic pain and painful sex as well, which we dive into Um, So I hope you guys enjoy this episode. I think that it is really opening up this conversation around sex and painful sex that we really do need to be having more of. So again, that we all feel safer and we feel like we can, you know, reach out to the people that we need for support. All of this does play into our overall health. And I think that, again, these are conversations that we need to be mindful of and aware of. And if you are experiencing uh, painful sex or any of the um, topics that we talk of today, then please do reach out to either myself, to Ash or to your GP, uh, and we can hopefully all point you in the right direction. So let's get into the episode. Hi, Ash, and welcome to Off The Record. I'm so excited to have you here today. I'm so excited to be here. I'm actually like, I'm just, I'm so stoked. I'm so excited to be talking to you and to be sharing whatever it is and talking about whatever it is that we get talking about today. I'm sure lots of like vaginas and stuff, which is my jam. So all about it, here for it. I feel between your talk of vaginas and my talk of bowels and shit, um, we have a really great <laughs> conversation ahead of us. <laughs> uh, no definitely. stone left unturned. I've- No, there is no such thing as TMI. Like people in my rooms always be like, oh, this is probably TMI. And I'm like, mate, there is no such thing. Um, Firstly, how did you get into, uh, so you're obviously a women's health physiotherapist. How did you get into this area? Yeah, so I'm, it's a small technicality, but I'm a physio who specializes in women's health. It's like a technicality in the physio world. I haven't gone through the titling process. Um, but yeah, I, I got into it because I, um, I don't know. I just, I've always been really passionate about women's health. I guess I grew up playing like team sports and being surrounded by women. And, um, I guess when I got into physio, like the sports and musk side of thing wasn't really for me. And we had a gender studies unit and I just loved it. I was like, yep, this is kind of something that really interests me. I went on to do a placement at the Royal Women's and I fell in love with that. And I guess that's kind of just put me on the path to where I am now. That plus my personal experience over the years. Yeah. So could you tell us a bit more about your personal experience and yeah, what that has been like your story of um, pain and, and all of that that got you sort of to where you are now? Yeah, absolutely. It's a long one, but I guess it all started with, um, I had a string of injuries. I had like a foot injury and then a knee injury and then another knee injury on the other leg and then a back injury. Story of my life. I know, I know. <laughs> I followed you on Instagram and for quite a while now and I've been like, I feel like I've been on that journey with you. Uh, yeah, it's like they just came one after another. Um, like I said, I played lots of sport. Funnily enough, they were never sporting injuries. Like one of them, I dislocated my knee, like standing up off the floor. Anyway, long story. But I can had, relate, a, can <laughs> had a string of bad injuries and the, the back was the one that got me that turned into like chronic back pain that lasted a few years. And somewhere in the mix of all that, I started to get pelvic pain, pain with sex. And I remember going to my doctor. Um, I was really fresh out of uni. Like I reckon I was in my first year maybe second. It was, it was a long time ago now. But I remember going to the GP really quite like nervous and shame, like all the things that women feel when they go to GPs to talk about this stuff. And that was like, even with all my professional knowledge, I was like, okay, like something's wrong here. I'm going to go get some help. So I went to the GP and this was a female GP. I went all the way there because it was someone that my mum had seen in the past and she was meant to specialize in women's health. So that seemed like a good course of action. 
And she was so dismissive. Like I think she sort of just looked at me and like I was young at this point. I was maybe like 20, 21. And she just looked at me and was like, yeah, okay, like as if that's kind of a normal thing. But she did a really sort of brief exam and diagnosed me with lichen sclerosis. And for anyone listening, lichen sclerosis is like a often genetic or in like autoimmune condition it's a skin condition where you get these white spots that start to like harden and shrivel up so I like I said I'd spent some time on placement at the Royal Women's and I had seen some pretty nasty cases of lichen sclerosis where women's vaginas in their like late 50s 60s 70s had literally like just the skin had gotten so tight and dry that they were like slammed shut so as a 21 year old receiving that diagnosis just off the cuff like here's a cortico like here's a steroid cream that you just have to apply every day for now on, best of luck. I got in the car and I just sat and bawled my eyes out. Like I didn't know what to do. I was like, I was distraught. I was concerned. I was stressed. I was anxious. I, I did what most people probably do. I called mum and I was like, mum, like, <laughs> like help. And mum's like, no, no, like it's okay. And I, I went home and I went back and like did my own sort of research and everything that was coming up said that lichen sclerosis had to be diagnosed by a biopsy. So I took myself back in there kind of like really sheepishly because I didn't want to step on, like I'm really young in my career here. Like I didn't want to step on the doctor's toes. I didn't want to tell her what to do, but I had nowhere else to go. I didn't know any other like doctors in the area that I'd been to. So I was like, I'll just go back and just you know, ask, Hey, maybe can we do a biopsy? And again, she was super dismissive. And she was like, I was then a little bit pushy at that point too. I was like, no, no, like I really would feel more comfortable if we had this biopsy done. So she was like, kind of whatever, flippantly, like we'll do it. Mind you, the biopsy was like excruciating. It was so painful. I was going to say, just even thinking about a biopsy. Yeah. So they're like cutting a piece out of my like labia. Like it was, it was, pretty fucked so I don't know if I can swear on this podcast oh it was oh great it was not nice so I get maybe that's why she didn't want to do it but also like this is a big diagnosis to hand a young woman with like no further investigation so she did the biopsy and the biopsy funnily enough came back negative and I remember just thinking from that experience like that was me with some level of experience in the health system some like a a health professional title, some knowledge. And I was still able to find myself in that experience where I was being dismissed by a GP and getting a diagnosis that's a lifelong diagnosis and putting a dangerous steroid cream on a really sensitive part of my body that did not need to be there. And I just walked away from that being like, okay, I need to help more women like me so that this does not happen. Mm. And I guess that's how I kind of like got into it, I guess. Yeah. Well, and I feel like I need to hear more about the story in the sense. So what happened next then? Like what, I guess, painful sex is something that is quite common. And I think we'll probably talk more about throughout this episode. So what was it in the end that like, was it related to your back pain or was it something else that was going on? And and how did you find out more about that for people who maybe are going through a similar sort of experiences to feeling like, you know, sex is quite painful for them? What, what would you suggest? Yeah, so I I took myself to, off to a women's health physiotherapist. The doctor didn't refer me there. You didn't need a referral anyway, but I just knew from my studies and, and what I knew about women's health that that was probably the next best course of action. So I went to a women's health physio and it was an overactive hypertonic pelvic floor, something that is very treatable and uh, very manageable without dangerous creams and, and things like that. Not that the cream itself is dangerous, but it's dangerous when it doesn't need to be used. Um, and yeah, I got, got the help that I needed and got back to the point of being pain-free and able to have sex again without experiencing pain. It took time and it took a lot of effort. And when I went to see the women's health physio, they were like, no, it's not related to your back pain at all. But now knowing what I know about pain, it absolutely was related. It was also probably related to the fact that I'd just moved out of home. I had lost a lot of my support network in that sense. I didn't have like a healthcare team around me that I had built up because all of my healthcare team was back home. And I like was in a toxic, relatively toxic job. I'd, I'd just started in and I'd had this string of injuries. Like my nervous system was all over the shop. So yeah, those things, those two things definitely were related, I believe. But uh, yeah, it took took a bit of time and and help from the women's health physio, but I got there in the end. 
Mm, that's incredible. And I think I resonate with you so much when you talk about like the pain being an experience of all of the things combined. Um, and in, in your experience working as a women's health, phys- oh, sorry, a physio specializing in women's <laughs> <That's> health, <okay. laughs> um, or actually in, in just a physio in general, it, is that something that you also see, you know, in your clients and stuff like that, it, pain is associated with, I guess, multiple factors? Yeah, pain. Um, I don't know how deep you want me to go into this, but pain absolutely is a multifaceted, complex human experience. It is not just tissue damage equals pain. That's kind of like what we're brought up to be like to our understanding of pain, especially in Australia and in our Western society. It's really fascinating the different messages we get told about pain growing up or the things we see in media. Like you only have to watch the TV or walk into a chemist and you'll see, you know, these images of someone like hunched over in pain with this like big red spot on their back. And, um, <laughs> like, and you, yeah, you're laughing because you can visualize it, right? I, like I see it. I see it. <laughs> that's, that's what we get sold here. Like we're told that like pain is this like awful experience that you can fix with a medication um because you're treating the tissue damage and that must be there right and that's exactly what I thought about my own back injury I was like no no I get chronic pain but that's that's not me like we were taught about it at uni in like one lecture um and I was like no no there there has to be something wrong and I took myself off the scans and and spoke to specialists and multiple physios and I tried acupuncture and I tried myotherapy and I tried osteopathy and I like I tried everything before I got to the point when I realized that, okay, maybe there was more to it. And it wasn't until I started understanding pain and educating myself around how pain does work and starting to meditate and, and leaving my ego at the door and starting from the ground up with like some really basic body weight exercises to, to build back up and get strong again. Um, it took a really long time. It was a really long journey, but yeah, that pain is, very multifaceted, all of those things, our stress, our lifestyle factors, how much sleep we get, what we eat, like what we think about ourselves, how we feel about our bodies, all of those things go into the bucket or the cup and it doesn't take much then for it to overfill and overflow and spill into pain that persists longer than it should. And that's definitely something that happens with sexual pain. Yeah, and how common is sexual pain? way more common than people think. I think the stats are something like uh, nearly three out of four women will experience painful sex at some point in their lives. So it's it's about 75%. It's a really high number of women that experience pain. And again, I think it goes back to what we're taught about not just pain, but about sex as well. Mm. Like sex is such a taboo here in Australia. And it's, I mean, I grew up in a Christian school too. And we had like a whole week in year nine that was abstinence week. And at the end of the week, we had to sign this pledge. That's like, I will save myself before marriage. <laughs> like that was my experience of sex. Like sex was bad. Masturbation was bad. No, it's like, they, this is what, do you remember that? Did you see that story that came out in, it was in New South Wales. I'm in Melbourne. Um, and it was, I think like this Christian school in Sydney that where they split the boys and the girls up and then the boys had to like rate. Yeah. That was basically like we had the same week. I don't think we had the whole rating thing. I never heard about that, but we definitely had the thing where we split up into boys and girls and we just got told for a week that like sex is our like gift to men and it's our like there's something that should be like held sacred for marriage so yeah that's that's that was my experience of sex and whether even if you're not in like raised in a religious environment we're just taught like no one talks about sex here like you're just you don't talk about sex it's like this really quiet thing behind closed doors we're all kind of really curious about it but we're like oh god don't talk about it that's a bit like taboo yeah is there anything that on that topic like that you would say that you wish people knew about sex yeah, that it should not be painful. Yeah. <laughs> so that's what I was going to say. Like, that, like we're taught here as girls, I think too, that we're just told like your first time is going to be painful, right? It's like we expect that sex will be painful. That's what we're taught. That's what we think. That's what we hear from our friends, from the media. Um, and we're not taught about pleasure because that's like dirty, right? We're not yeah. taught that How you should enjoy it. Yeah. It's like this thing that you do and it's going to be you're like told to expect that it's going to be really painful. And then, so when it is painful, women are like, oh, okay, like, I guess that's normal and then when it continues to be painful they're like maybe that's just how it's meant to be and because no one wants to talk about it no one thinks like okay I'm going to go and ask my doctor Mm. whether or not this is normal because I don't want to seem stupid because maybe it is just me maybe it is just meant to be normal so 
yeah, that's probably the biggest thing I want people to know is sex. Painful sex is never normal. That's not sex should be pleasurable and enjoyable and something that you love doing. And when it's not, if it's painful, there's usually something wrong and something that can be done about it. Yeah. And I think that's the thing for me that I found. So having worked with IBS a lot, I was actually working in a um, a clinic that specialized in pelvic pain. And um, one of the things that, so I obviously saw a lot of people who had pelvic pain at the same time as IBS and those sorts of things. Um, and one of the things that I guess really surprised me about, um, and I, I don't know why it surprised me, but one of the things that surprised me was that people who were presenting with, you know, pain during sex and pelvic pain, it was very treatable. Like people would go within, you know, it, it would take sometimes quite a few sessions, but like sort of within six months, a lot of people had gone from sex being excruciating to it being quite a pleasurable experience. Um, and actually for the first time in their life enjoying it. And these were women like in their sort of like 60s, 70s even. And it's like, oh, like your whole life has been spent, like, you know, sort of enduring this pain, just thinking that like that's what you have to put up with when it's actually a really, again, as far as my understanding, I'd love you to go into more, but it's relatively treatable. Yeah, it depends what's causing it. But for the most part, more often, especially in like yours and mine, like in our population, just young women that haven't had kids and we're all like overstressed and overworked and trying to run social lives and trying to like die into this like hustle culture and we're like always on and our pelvic floor then is always on as well. So that's kind of where we hold a lot of our stress. And so, and then we go to Pilates classes, right? And we're told like, you know, like hold and like brace and switch on and like zip up through your pelvic floor, like constantly for like 50 minutes. So it's no wonder that our pelvic floors are really tired. So like hypertonic and overactive pelvic floors are really, really easily treatable, easily in the sense that it's a simple thing to do, not easily in the sense of how quick it happens, but it can happen quickly. Um, things like endometriosis, obviously that's a, it's a more complex condition, but I find that most women with endo also have overactive pelvic floor because of the whole like protective guarding thing that's going on. So although we can't easily treat the the endometriosis, we can help a, a make, and make a really big difference with treating the pelvic floor. Things like STIs and infections and, and thrush and whatnot, obviously they're usually quite easily treatable. Um, yeah, there's, there's lots of different reasons and for the most part they are all really easily managed. Mm. Are there any reasons um, aside from the ones that you've mentioned that sex would be painful? They're the main ones. There's definitely, like I said, other conditions like lichen sclerosis or, or skin conditions or autoimmune conditions. Um, the main ones that you'll probably hear of are things like vaginismus, which again is an involuntary spasm of the pelvic floor muscles. And a lot of that comes down to it's the biggest thing I want to preface this whole conversation is that it's not in your head. You're not imagining it. Yes. I think when a lot of women are told that um, you know, stress plays a role or that, oh, just relax and, and it'll sort itself out. That's definitely not the case. There's, again, I said pain is really complex and it's not as simple as just like m muscle damage or tissue damage equals pain, but it's also not as simple as like relax and it'll get better. But there is a, a really big click big link with your brain and your spinal cord, your nervous system and the role that that plays in pain. So uh, the, the link there, I guess, is when you are really stressed or if, if your body determines that something's a threat, like, like endometriosis or IBS, if that whole region is kind of on high alert because there's something there that is threatening and dangerous, our nervous systems try to protect us from that and we feel protection as pain. Mm, yeah. And again, my experience with pain it has been like that in the sense that like, it's all of these things. And yeah, it's so, I guess, disregarding when people say, oh, it's all in your head. And again, I have had so many clients in the IBS space that have said that as well, like, you know, that they've been disregarded because it's all in their head. And the way that I try and explain it to people is like, it's not all in your head in the sense that like, you're not making this up. But the experience of pain is one that originates in our brain. Like, you know, the experience, like any feeling that you have or any sort of um, sensation that you have really does arise in the brain because it's through that signaling that is happening, you know, through yeah. your nervous system and through your spinal cord and everything. So the brain pay plays such a large role in pain that I think that the saying it's all in your brain or it's all in your head is so wrong and so right at the same time yeah. because it's like well actually it is all in your head because <laughs> yeah, that's where your brain's like, in your head <laughs> yeah <laughs> like yeah it, everything is all in your head if like you know our brain controls our whole body so 
technically, you know, everything originates from our head. So I think that it's it's an invalidating term, but also if you understand the complexity of it, it can be seen as one that it's not invalidating in the sense that it's like, yeah, the, the brain plays such a large role in managing pain. And yes, it's not as simple as just do a meditation or those sorts of things. It's, and I would love to get onto this topic, but like it's addressing past traumas and, and those sorts of things. Because one of the things that I have personally found in my experience working with people, again, with pelvic pain and everything, is that there is a fairly high prevalence of um, trauma in like early childhood um, trauma um, or even adulthood trauma that is then, uh, I guess, sort of brought up in the sense of pain. Yeah, absolutely. There's a book called The Body Keeps the Score. I haven't read it yet, but it's oh, on my so it's on my to-do list. Um, yeah, that, but it's just even that sentence sentence in itself, right? The body keeps the score. We remember everything, every experience that we've ever had shapes all future experiences that we ever will have. And our body holds on to that. It's definitely like there's, and there's a big part of sexual trauma involved in sexual pain. And that's sometimes where pain can get a lot more complex, but even if it's, like I said, it may not be trauma, but it could be addressing how you think and how you feel about your body. And I certainly, when I was going through all of my sexual pain, I hated my body. Like it had put me through hell. I had been through so many injuries. I, because of the injuries, I like, I grew up being the sporty one. I was always really fit and athletic and then not being able to exercise for such a really long period of time on and off. My body shape had changed. Also, I was just like becoming a woman and getting curves that like I expected myself to be the weight that I was when I was 19, right? That's just unrealistic. And so I was like, I, I just resented my body for everything that had been through every way that it had failed me, all of the the weight that I'd put on or the cellulite that I'd developed because I wasn't exercising in the way that I used to. And all of that went into my pain experience. It has to. And that's not to say that like, you know, your pain is different to my pain or anyone else's pain. This is just how pain works in the human body. Like you said, everything originates from our brain. Pain is an output of the brain, not an input. There's no such thing as pain receptors around the body. Like, um, you know, receptors that are detecting pain. We have what's called nociceptors and they're operating all the time. They're always looking for danger. Uh, and if we sense something like pressure is too much or, or a sensation of heat or cold is too much, like if you put your hand on a hot plate, that sends a message up to the brain to say, hey, like it's a bit hot down here and your brain responds with pain to get you to withdraw your hand off the hot plate, right? So that's how pain works. It's an output of the brain and all of our thoughts, our feelings, our behaviors, our past experiences, the things we do, the things we say, people in our lives, certain places, all of those things can trigger off our pain response. And absolutely it's like, you're not, and I had to learn this the hard way <laughs> by going through it. You can't get to the other side of pain unless you accept that and then do the work to get through that. Mm, and what does doing the work to get through that look like or what did it look like for you? Yeah, like you said, it's not as simple as just do a meditation. I describe it as like, you know, if you're driving a car, your sympathetic nervous system is the accelerator. And often in modern society, we've got our foot hard slammed against the accelerator. Like I said, we're go, go, go. We're like trying to keep up with like juggling jobs and studying and working and social lives and financial stress and all of these other things that that go into what makes up our day-to-day -day lives and our parasympathetic nervous system, the rest and digest system is like the break. And so if your foot is hard slammed on the accelerator, you're always living in fight or flight mode. And then you tap the brake a couple of times, like it's not going to slow down the car, right? <laughs> it's you can't just be like, I tried meditation. Meanwhile, you still it's, got the foot on the like, yeah. accelerator hardcore, but like I'm exactly, just gonna tap the, I'm just going to tap head. the brake. Yeah, yeah, exactly, without like acknowledging, and that's what I mean, doing the work in terms of being like, okay, yeah, I'm really stressed, and stress doesn't have to be a bad thing. Like, it can be things that you're doing that you love. You're just spinning a lot of plates, but your stresses, like your environmental stress or your workload or, or whatever it might be goes into that. So looking at, okay, how much time am I putting aside for myself? How much time am I doing for the basics, like eating well, sleeping well, moving well? Like what are the things that I'm doing to prioritize my self-care? Am I just like burning myself and burning the candle at both ends? Or am I actually taking time to rest and digest. And like I said, that's not as simple as just doing a meditation and being like, oh, great. I feel so much better. But understanding pain, understanding how it works, understanding it's a long-term approach in the sense that 
you've kind of got to do these things over time and commit to them. It's not just like a short term thing. You do a couple of meditations and your pain will go away. So doing the work for me, like I said, looked like taking a step back from fighting against my body, doing the work on learning to appreciate and accept and love my body again, leaving my ego at the door because I was always so fit and active and to go back to like body weight exercises when I used to be able to lift yes. quite heavy it was, was so like really quite demor- very demoralizing. So I had to like leave my ego at the door there and just be like, okay, this is where I'm at and just meet my body where I'm at and work with it rather than against it. And really like properly commit to the, like I was doing the meditations every day. I'd come home and like lie on my little Shakti mat and I'd do my meditations. And yes, they wouldn't have like an immediate short-term effect, but 12 months of that and I got there. Yeah. Yeah. And I think for me, like I spent so long um, over the years sort of like, I guess putting meditation, self-care and all of these sorts of things in boxes that I needed to tick. Like, and I'm not even kidding when I say that, like I'd have like meditation on my to-do list. Like, <laughs> I'm such a perfectionist. But like I would have like all of these like yeah, little boxes that I'd need to tick. And it was like almost like you're not doing them for the purpose of doing them. You're doing them to almost like I guess feed your ego and be like, oh, I meditated. And like, oh, I'm doing the things that are good for me. And it's like are you actually like – are you taking the time to sort of address the things that are, I guess, putting you in the situations? And sometimes they're not like out in our control. So for example, there's lots of things like, you know, financial stresses and pressures and those sorts of things that we don't have control over. But if we don't have control over them, then I think that the next best thing that we can do is to have, um, I guess, outlets to sort of let out our stress. And so whether that be through things like hobbies or through connections and, and whatnot, and, in today's society, that's just such a thing of the past. Like, I don't know, apart from my partner, he's got a million hobbies, but like <laughs> women in particular, I think really yeah. struggle with the concept of like play and hobbies and rest and relaxation from a genuine um, switch off perspective, as opposed to like, I'm doing self care. Like, this is so nice. It's like, yeah. it's not, I don't know, I, I don't know how to describe it without it just being like, it's not self care if you're just doing it for the sake of doing it. It's more about addressing what are the things that you you need to be doing in order to feel better. And for me personally, I think that that was like, like I said, I've been doing all these meditations and everything, but the root of a lot of mine, I think came back to this like feeling of never feeling good enough. And that was just, I guess, a core belief that I have had for a very long time. And I didn't realize how much that that was then, I guess, driving me to do, 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 and never switch off properly. And so for me, that was, I guess, my sort of turning point for my pain was going, oh, wow, like I'm doing so much because I don't feel worthy, because I don't feel like I'm good enough. So therefore, how dare I ever switch off? Yeah, it's so true. And like, I kid you not, the thought that went through my mind right before I injured my back in the first place, I was doing these like ridiculously heavy squats and following this like bodybuilding program. And the thought that went through my mind before I couldn't get off the bench after the hip thrust was <laughs> I'm like, I want a big booty. Like my my back hurt and I pushed through the 20 reps of this ridiculously heavy weight. Like I felt my back go on the second set on the second rep. Oh my gosh. And I pushed through because I'm like, I want a bigger booty. And I am like, I'm not ashamed of that thought because it's just like it's the reality of what happened. But just sad. Like I'm so, I just want to hug my past self and just be like, what? Like why? That is so, so fucked up. Right. And, and like I said, then I couldn't get off the bench. And then what followed on from that was, as you heard, like years of chronic pain. And it wasn't until that I, I took my foot off the accelerator and I started exercising because it was going to build me back up and make me feel good and bring me joy, just moving my body and appreciating the little things as opposed to being in the gym to build a certain body type that was not my body type and was never going to be my body type. Yeah. And and my experience was very similar as that. On the um on the topic of the painful sex, I wanted to speak to you about the impact I guess that that is having on people. Um, like you said, it's something that is obviously like a very taboo topic still. Um, what I guess like what impact do you see it having on people, whether it be physically, mentally, emotionally? Is this also then contributing? I guess like is it like a vicious cycle where it's then leading to worse pain? Yeah, absolutely. Like pain 
is exhausting when you're in pain for a really long period of time. It's all you think about. It's like it bleeds into every facet of your day. You're like, you want to go out for brekkie with your friends and you're like, well, I can't sit in those chairs at that certain cafe or your friend offers to pick you up and you're like, well, I can't sit in your car for too long because I know that my car's more comfortable so I feel safer driving in my own car. Like it, it bleeds into every thought of everything you do. And for painful sex, that for me bled into like I didn't want to get changed in front of my partner because I didn't want him to see me getting changed and want to start something knowing that mm. I couldn't do that because it was hurt. And it that then takes like an emotional toll because then as a female I felt like I wasn't able to contribute my part of the relationship. And like, and this is all on me. Like my partner was like, sex is off the cards. Like I, like the last thing he wanted to do was hurt me. Right. (laughs) He was like, we're not even doing that. That's okay. He was so supportive and so loving, but it was all in my own head that I was like, I just, I just felt like I was letting him down and I was letting the relationship down and that emotional toll, like the weight of that, like almost destroyed me. And I think the best thing that people can do whether you're in a supportive relationship or, or if you're single or whatnot, just like as best as you can be honest and upfront and communicate what it is that's going on. If you are in a supportive relationship, which I find a lot of these women are quite often, like, I I don't know if that's just like my experience of the ones that I see um, in the clinic, but most people I find are it's, they're in some sort of long-term relationship. Um, and I like that's there's there's no causative factor there. It's just just my <laughs> observation. <laughs> observation. Um, I don't know if that's just that I'm not maybe women that are single, they're not having sex, so then they're not coming in to get treated. I don't know. Anyway, that was a really big side Actually, tangent. But, but on but- that note, I wonder if it's because that they're comfortable enough to have the conversation because they are in a long term relationship, whereas if they're in they're not in a long term relationship and they're potentially only having casual sex, they feel like that they should just put up with it because it's I guess a bit more sporadic maybe. And it's like, oh, well, it's, you know, this weekend, but not next weekend. Like I'm not. (laughs) Yeah. Or it's just easier to be like, okay, I just won't have sex. Like I don't want to, I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to go to the doctor. I'll just not have sex. So then they're not kind of getting any help or, or whatnot because it's not impacting them in that sense. But yeah, interesting thought. Um, I kind of remember what I was saying before. Oh, the communication. Um, yeah, like I, I, like I said, if you're in a loving long-term relationship, the last thing your partner I would imagine hopefully wants to do is hurt you or see you in pain. And I know a lot of women's health physios will give you the permission to take sex off the cards. And that's certainly what they did for me. They were like, just, you don't need to have sex. And it was just really refreshing to hear someone just give me permission that that was okay. Yeah. And I think having a conversation with your partner as well as to like, what other ways can you pleasure and show love and everything to each other that don't involve like penetrative sex? Absolutely. Like there's, there's so many ways, like you've obviously got all of you without going into them all, but like oral sex, like mutual mas- masturbation, like watch porn together. If that's your thing, like do whatever it is that you've like, you can kiss, you can hug, you can spend like intimate time together with sex off the cards for once, like just yeah. playing board games. Like you can spend time and like getting to know each other and, and exploring intimacy in different ways it's kind of in that sense an exciting time in deepening your connection and your relationship with sex just completely off the cards and in a lot of ways it brought us together Mm. and yeah was that conversation difficult for you to have like when you first brought it up with your partner was that a difficult conversation to have with him that's a really interesting question I actually don't I don't ever recall like sitting down and having the conversation I think it was Mm. more that like we both noticed that sex was painful and I went to see the physio and the physio was like, yeah, just take a, take a break from sex for a while. And my partner was just like, yeah, like that's like, that's obviously what we were doing anyway. It was not, I don't think it was really even a conversation that I had to have. And I guess I'm really privileged in that sense to have that sort of relationship and Um, to have someone who is really supportive of that. I know I've had women that are like terrified to tell their partner that they can't have sex or that it's painful and their partners don't even know because they just kind of push through it without wanting to, to stop it and, and make the other person feel uncomfortable or, or to feel like they have to be the one that's stopping it all the time. Um, it's, it's really hard. Yeah. So upsetting. Um, I guess that's like a bigger problem in itself, right? If you feel like you can't communicate or talk to your partner, that's probably a a larger issue. And quite often, (laughs) 
quite often that's like a big reason behind sex being painful. Like we spoke about trauma and our past experiences, but if you're unhappy in your relationship or if you're not feeling validated or supported or heard in your relationship, your body doesn't want to have sex with this person. Like that's not, you're not imagining that your body's just like, nope, we are closed for business because this person does not make us feel good. And and I guess that's the ultimate form of connection. Like, and so if you're not connecting on every other level, then why would your body want to connect on this level? Yeah, absolutely. Of course your body's not going to respond and, and, feel aroused and and want to be doing that if you've if you're fighting all the time or if they make you feel like shit that's that's a whole thing in itself Mm. I guess for the listeners at home I think that one of the the things that if you are experiencing painful sex that that having the confidence to talk about it is such an important thing whether it be with your partner whether it be with a physio whether it be with your GP Um, and I guess like if those experiences are invalidating, whether again, it's from your partner or from your GP or from your physiotherapist that to, I guess, support, like find more support from somebody else, because there is obviously people like yourself out there who are uh, supportive and encouraging and helpful and everything in that. Do you have any advice for people at home who, you know, might be sort of, I guess, getting pushed back from either their GP or their partner that, you know, it's again, all in your head and just push through? Yeah, absolutely. Like you said, just building a, your healthcare team should be like your ultimate cheerleaders. Like if your healthcare team is not supporting you and that goes for not just painful sex, like in any facet of your health, if your healthcare team is making you feel demoralized or if they're dismissing you or if they're making you feel crazy, like you need a different healthcare team. And those practitioners unfortunately still exist out there in many different professions. Um, but like you said, there's professionals out there that are really supportive and willing to listen and to be on the journey with you rather than like this kind of power struggle of you'll do what I say. And if you're getting dismissed or if you don't feel like you're getting the support that you need, absolutely. Like find a different practitioner, whether that be doing a Google research and finding other ones in your area, getting, you know, someone like a personal friend's recommendation or speaking with a health professional that you do trust. Like if you have a massage therapist that you go to like every now and then and you get along with them really well, maybe speak to them and see if they have a connection or a network for a doctor that they've come across that specializes in women's health. You don't have to divulge all of the history, but it can just be finding if you already have a healthcare professional that you've been to that you do connect well with, chances are they've got someone in their network that could help you. Yeah, amazing. So we have spoken a lot about um, painful sex for women, um, and I recognize that you are obviously speaking and working with a lot of women. Does painful sex also occur for men? Yes, it does. I don't know much about it, but I know that it would. I don't like when we talk about painful sex for women, like I said, a lot of it's to do with like the muscles or the tissues around the vagina. I mean, men have pelvic floors as well. And I imagine the same issue can happen to them, but yeah, I'm not, I'm not super experienced in men's painful sex. I imagine painful sex for men would probably have more to do with like, um, I suppose like urinary tract and like semen, like ejaculation, like that, mechanism i (laughs) that sounds i yeah i clearly don't know too much about it but yeah absolutely i do know that men can experience painful sex so for if there's definitely like a guy listening it's like hey i experience it too um yeah like you're validated that happens i just don't know much about it (laughs) no no and, and i guess that's the point of me bringing it up is to validate the fact that yes it does occur um in both sexes and also i'm assuming in um transgender people as well Yeah, absolutely. Like, especially if you haven't had gender reassignment surgery, you can be uh, a trans male who has the sex organs of a female gender. So absolutely, like um, trans gender people can still experience all of those issues, which uh, are, you know, really quite complex. And again, it comes back to a lot of different factors. But yeah, lots of when we when we say women, I I mean, uh, people who are assigned gender female at birth. Yeah. Yeah. No. Um, and I think again, the importance there of having a supportive team, like you were saying is probably, it's just so key so that you feel safe and comfortable to have these conversations with your healthcare professionals or even be it your family and your friends, you know, whoever it is that is your like cheerleaders, like you said, um, to start having that conversation so that you don't feel alone in this journey, because I guess it, it being a taboo topic, it is one of those journeys that you can sometimes feel really isolated in. 
Yeah, hundred percent. And I think the more that we get comfortable with just saying the word vagina, like we've all got one, vagina, let's just vagina, like start vagina, using vagina. it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because the more that we get comfortable with talking about that, the more that we're going to be able to talk about it with our friends and our family and then our healthcare professionals. And the more that we can start to feel less alone and less ashamed and the more that we can, you know, just, I, I just, a quote came to mind um, do you know the work of Brene Brown? Are you familiar with Brene Brown? Of course. She's like my queen. Um, <laughs> she, she has this quote and I'm going to butcher it, but it's something along the lines of basically that shame cannot exist when shared. So if you're feeling ashamed or if you're feeling guilty or if you're, if you're holding onto all of those emotions, the second you speak it out loud with someone who is empathetic and listens and supports you, shame can't exist. Shame cannot mm. exist in that environment. So I think that's where it comes back to finding someone, whether that's a healthcare professional or even a friend or, or a partner, someone that you can confide in and open up about it. And as soon as they go like, that's okay. I'm really glad you told me that. Thank you for sharing that with me shame disappears. Really yeah. And I so resonate with that in the sense that like, I was just reflecting then on my pain journey as well. And I think that I, I've fortunately been quite pain-free for quite a few months now. And I think that the things that have changed over the last, I guess, 18 months for me is one of the things I've become much better at is communicating and connecting with the people around me. Like it was something that, and it was just a learned behavior that I sort of had gathered through my childhood and everything is that like you deal with everything yourself. Like you, it's just, you're, it's all you, like you don't share things. You don't, you know, reach out for help. You don't, you just get on, soldier on, do your own thing. Yeah. Get on with it. Right. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> we don't talk about feelings. No. <laughs> um, and I think one of the things that really has, I'm, I'm just thinking about it now, like is that whether it actually contributed to me releasing some of the pain in my body and everything is whether becoming more open and being able to share, you know, things with friends and family and whatnot. Um, I don't doubt that there probably is some connection there where, you know, I've been able to sort of, I guess, share my shame and share, you know, my experiences and everything like that, that, I now no longer hold on to as much pain as I definitely, you know, was a couple of years ago. Yeah. And like we said, I mean, with painful sex, particularly it's like 75% of women, chances are like your entire girlfriend group has experienced this and we're all just being really quiet about it. I've been really um, like, as I've, I've been on the same journey. Like I never used to be so open about talking about all of this. And now in my group chats, I'll just be like really open about talking about like low libido or like sex drive or, or painful sex or what's going on in our sex labs and like or pleasure <laughs> probably. Even. I feel That's like it. that is yes. such a taboo topic. Like, you know, how, and this is on me, like how many times have I said to my girlfriends like, oh, like what's the best way you get pleasure? Like, yes, yeah, yeah, <laughs> I've that's never it. said that to my girlfriends, but like, why not? Yeah, yeah, we have this like thing in our group chat. We're like a little bit of menage a moi time. <laughs> <laughs> because it. it's like there is something so beautiful about women sharing their experiences with other women, right? Because we just, we probably all have the same experience. We all want to know the same things. If you're thinking it, chances are your entire friendship group is as well. And it's just, yeah, really nice to be like, like, what's your toy that you've really enjoyed? Like, it's kind of like the more that we can talk about these things again, shame just completely dissipates because we're all thinking it, we're all feeling it, we're all wondering it, we're all doing it. So let's just talk about it. Exactly. And I think that's, I guess, one of the core purposes of having this podcast is like, let's talk about some of these things that are having such a profound impact on our whole well being. And I think like, um, you know, painful sex and like taboo topics like sex is, it is having an impact on our health as a whole because you can't be, I guess, healthy in the sense of like, you know, feeling like yourself when you are in pain, whether that be pain through sex, whether it be pelvic pain, whether it be knee pain, back pain, whatever it is. Again, through my experience as well, like is you just, the reason why you can't be healthy is like you said, is because it infuses every aspect of your life and you can't function in society when you are in pain like that. And I think, again, I haven't had experience with painful sex, but like I dare say it would be the same sort of thing. It just brings, like you said, that shame to every aspect of your life and you start questioning and doubting yourself. And it's like, well, how can I be a confident? Um, Cause to me, health is about like, I guess, confidence and um, I guess just being able to be the best version of yourself is sort of what health, is to me. And I think we can't do that if we've got this like pain that is 
affecting every aspect of us and that we're not sort of consciously working towards in some way, whether it be yeah with a professional, whether it be through doing, you know, relaxation exercises, meditations. I think it's such an important part of health being able to address these sorts of things and have these conversations. Yeah, I use it. I use the term just as you were talking. It made me, it reminded me in my clinic when I'm working with women or just patients in general, I like to talk about it as buckets of care. So, you know, meditation and mindfulness will make up one bucket, right? The other buckets might be surgery or medication or other sort of biomedical things. Another bucket might be lifestyle stuff like getting your sleep, prioritizing your sleep or or taking your foot off the accelerator and practicing some pacing and scheduling in some rest time and downtime and, and little weekends away for yourself or just digital detoxes. It might be another market, another bucket might be things like yoga or acupuncture or other complementary therapies. Another bucket might be supplements. A whole bucket is diet. Like each of these, like we take little percentages for each of these buckets to add up to a holistic program, a holistic care package that's going to attack or, or attacks the wrong word, um, that's going to address every different area of your life and your body because you're not just, at the end of the day, you're not just a vagina. You're not just a pelvis or a, or a gut or, or an arm or a knee or whatever it is that's giving you pain. And I think traditionally medicine and healthcare is always focused on, okay, you've got a knee injury. Let's like treat the knee without looking more broadly about, okay, well, how do you feel about your body? What's going on in your life? Your knee always seems to hurt at work. How do you feel about your job? Like look at all of these different things because they all come into pain and our experiences of injuries and and pain. And you've really got to look holistically because at the end of the day, we are a whole human Mm. that functions in society, like you said, in all of these different aspects of our life and our pain's bleeding into all of them. So we've got to look at why. Yeah. Amazing. So uh, to sort of wrap up, what would you suggest somebody who, um, like, where would you suggest somebody begin like their first steps when they are, you know, sort of resonating with everything that we're saying? Um, do they come to a physio first? Should they go to their doctor? Does it matter? Like where, where do we go? If you've got a good GP, start there. If you've got a really good relationship with your GP, you feel really confident in them, you've been seeing them for a while, or even if you haven't seen them for a while, but you've seen them a couple of times and you feel like you really trust them and they've got your back, start there. That's always a good place to start because with painful sex, it is really good to still rule out the the basics or the the nasties, like ruling out cervical cancer, make sure your pap smears are up to date, ruling out any sort of blood disorders or infections or, or things like that. So that's always a good place to start. But if you don't have a good GP or a good health professional that you trust, I'd say it could even be a good place to start with a women's health physio because more often than not, the pelvic floor is involved, even if it's another cause that's causing it. Like if you've had recurrent thrush, often the pelvic floor is then really tight and protective because there's been like like an injury, I guess, to that area for a really long period of time. So there's usually a pelvic floor element. So they can at least get started on addressing that. And I have never met a women's health physio who is not the most like supportive like person that that you have ever met. Like they're all just so gentle exactly and that. kind and empathetic and like they're just like beautiful humans. And I think starting with them because chances are they have got a good GP or something that they work with that they can refer you off to to go and do all of the other things, the other investigations, and at least then you know that you're you're being supported, you're being heard, and you're getting the help that you need. Yeah, and I would agree with that in the sense that, like, if you start with a, a physio that um, you know specialises in women's health, then you at least are in, a, I guess, an environment where everybody's experiencing the same thing. So then you've got a referral network, I guess. So, you know, whether it be a GP, whether it be a psychologist, whether it be, you know, tests that you need to get done, you've got, I guess, a beginning point that you know is somebody who is probably, like you said, like I'm the same, like every women's health physio that I've met is just so lovely and so caring and compassionate and empathetic that they're going to care for you and they're going to make sure that the help that they're giving you is in your best interest. Um, if you feel like the physio that you are going to or anything is not that, then again, like find somebody who you yeah. do feel like, you know, obviously when it comes to like our genitals and everything, like it is a, a, a place of our body that we are quite, um, what's the word? 
protective of but it's it's something that's obviously quite um yeah. you know personal to us yeah, yeah so if you feel like you're being mistreated or whatever then obviously like you know you don't have to stick with the one but um yeah starting with a, a women's health physio I think is a really great place to begin and I used to say the same about um dietetics as well as like you know if you don't have a good GP to go to but you do you know know of a good dietitian or something start there because then they can sort of help plant you into the environment where you know you are supported by the other team members as well that's it like you'd be the same like i'm sure you're connected with gps that specialize in in what you specialize in so it's the same with women's health physios if you're going to a women's health physio for like pelvic pain or or women's health issue chances are their network of of doctors and psychologists and um, everyone that they meet specializes in women's health because that's who they connect with so it's a really good way to find a network of good health professionals because you're starting at a place that's already like in that circle versus just finding any old GP that doesn't necessarily specialize in women's health. Chances are they don't. And I find just a lot of, a lot of like my, my GP didn't refer me to a women's health physio. I, I think a lot of GPs just don't know what we do. And I was having this conversation with, I've got a client who's a medical student and I asked her about this and she was like, yeah, we actually like don't get taught what allied health professions do. It's not part of their training. And I was like, I was blown away, but also not surprised because it explained so much. Like they're not, they're told about the different professions, but not necessarily the ins and outs of what each allied health profession does. So that's why often they may not refer you to a physio for an injury. They'll probably just do it, do an x-ray and, and send you off to a specialist or a surgeon or something like that. Cause they work within the medical field. Anyway, that's like another big tangent, but yeah, starting with a women's health physio, I think is a good place to start if you're experiencing this and you don't need a GP referral or anything to go see one. You can just take yourself in and find find one that you like that's close enough to home that you can get to that feels supportive for you. Amazing. And um, where can people find you online to follow your content and your um yeah, yeah, your practice and everything like that. Yeah, I'm online on Instagram at the Women's Life Physio. I practice at the moment at Upwell Health Collective in Camberwell. I'm in Melbourne. Um, but yeah, you can always, I've got uh, for Victoria and even some in Sydney and some in Queensland, I've got just different women's health physios that I have connected with over the years. So if you are ever looking for recommendations in any of those areas, I might be able to help, help point you in the right way. Um, and even like I had someone the other day from Wellington, New Zealand that I've like, I know nothing about Wellington, New Zealand, but I know what I'm looking for when I do a Google search. So I've helped quite a few women like find someone that I'm like, yep, this person looks good. Uh, so yeah, you can always, my DMs are always open. You can um, send me a message and I'll try and find someone that's local to you. Amazing. Thank you so much for that. We'll um, put your tags and everything and your um, your details in the show notes. So if you didn't quite get that, um, then it'll be in the show notes for you there. Um, thank you so much for this conversation today, Ash. I think it's such an important conversation to be having and hopefully uh, people have sort of walked away from this, I guess, having a new appreciation for um, painful sex and what they can do about it. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me. And like I said, I'm just so open and and I like we said off air, the biggest thing I want to do with my story and and even my professional practice is just help the more women I can help feel less alone and more empowered to learn to love themselves and their bodies. Um I'm here for it. That's everything that I'm about. So thanks for having me and being allowing me to share my story and to help me do that. No, my pleasure. It sounds like we have very similar um we do. To- <laughs> Yes. Life and purpose and all of that. Yeah, it's been so great to connect with you. Thanks for having me. Amazing. Thank you. What a cracking episode. I am so appreciative of Ash joining us and having that conversation. She is such a wealth of knowledge in this area. And I think it's such an important conversation for us to be having and to be sort of pulling out from underneath the rug, so to say, and sort of bringing to light so that people, you know, if you're sitting at home and you are struggling with some of these things that we're speaking about, that you feel like you are comfortable enough to go out into the real world and to have this conversation with, you know, your family, your friends, your loved ones, or your health professionals. So please, if this episode has brought up anything for you, please do feel like you can reach out to those around you or reach out to Ash, myself, or um, and we can point you in the right direction. So again, thank you so much for tuning into this episode. I do really appreciate the time that you guys put into listening to this, and I hope that you get something valuable out of it. 
Um, if you would like to share this episode with somebody, um, please share it on your social media, take a screenshot and make sure you tag me and Ash as well. Uh, and thank you so much for tuning in and I'll see you guys next week. Bye.